I want to talk about uh, Jerusalem, and it's basically the tale of two cities, Jerusalem and Babylon, and try to differentiate these two uh, uh, power bases, because they've been here all along. You know, two of the most ancient cities are Jerusalem and Babylon. They go back to all archaeologists realize that these two cities go back at least 4,000 years. After that, any recognition of time that people may claim to is very speculative. Because we know, when did the flood occur? About 2,348 BC. So these two cities arose because they're both well, in, well established as cities by archaeologists by the second century BC, which is 2000 BC. So these two cities sprung up and existed. And what I want to show today is that one city represents God. He chose a place to dwell and it's never varied. It's always been Jerusalem. And the other city has always been a picture of authority and counter authority to God's will. And we'll try to establish that a little bit in the scriptures today. So um, let's take a look at, at uh, Babylon. Um, I want to, we arrived at this topic, by the way, because we've been marching through Genesis and then I took a time off to deviate uh, with some other teaching for a few weeks. And then um, Today we're going back to it, and we ended with Genesis 11. So let me read uh, Genesis 11 to get a picture. Remember we just went through the creation, the flood, and then we went through um, the table of nations, which we all should be familiar with at least its location. If we want to, uh, if, we're, if we're studying um, Gog or Magog or the Assyrians or the Egyptians, you can find their descendants from the 70 children from Shem, Ham, and, Nath, uh, uh, and J Japheth, which were the three sons of Noah. God said that all the descendants of the earth are descendants from those three gentlemen, those three sons of Noah. Chapter 10 is a powerful chapter because with it, you can trace back the people and where their origins lie as far as um, those three sons and where they migrated to. In fact, the first verse um, says, uh, I'll, I'll read the first verse and there on. And it says, and the whole earth was one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Sh Shinar and they dwelt there. Okay, this is post-flood. The, what, the, what it's referring to here is Noah lands on the mountains of Ararat, which are to the northeast of, the, of Babylon, today's Babylon, and ancient the location of Babylon. And so they journeyed from the east after they grew in population. They migrated to the Mesopotamia Valley where Babylon is. Why? Yeah, it's called the Fertile Crescent. It starts from the Persian Gulf, goes west, all through the, it includes the Euphrates and circles down along uh, Lebanon and, and ends at the southern end of Israel. And it's very fertile. And so it was a perfect play, place for the uh, blossoming of civilization. And that's what we proved archeologically. Uh, that is the cradle of civilization. From there, um, we found some interesting migratory patterns, which I'll mention here in a minute. So let me read here. And they said to one another, go, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. Uh, interesting, when you look up this word slime, it's bitumen, which is an oil-based product, which, is there any oil in the Mideast? Yeah, and they said, "Go tell, go to, let us build a city and a tower, whose top may reach under uh, unto heaven, and let us make 
us a name, lest we. What am I? Remember, I'm having a problem. I'm on the wrong version. Sorry. I'm switching to the NASB. In five, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. The Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have the same language. And this is what they began to do. And now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Now, parenthetically, there's a lot of people that go, oh, this is ridiculous. This whole tower of Babel and how God's, you know, multiplied all the languages. Well, maybe a hundred years ago, that might have been a, the Bible, if you didn't believe the Bible was true. That might have been a, sounds like a myth story to me. But what has... Um, the, the study of the migrations of men and language evolution discovered over the last hundred years. All pathways lead back to Babylon, the Tower of Babel. So if you want to study English or Chinese or African languages or Russian, any language on the globe, when they trace the language back, and they can do this, they can trace the language back geographically, they all lead back to battle. Now, is that just accidental? And they've also discovered multiple other things that just trace back to the Mesopotamia area, such as wines, great um, subspecies. They've discovered that the original core wine species, or the grape that produces wine, started back with Noah, I guess, but they all trace back to Turkey. And from there, all the different kinds, they can follow the migration patterns of these different types. If you run them in reverse, they all end up in that region. And there's many examples of that so God saying come let us go down there and confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech so the Lord shattered them uh, scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth and they stopped building the city therefore its name was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth and from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. So, this word Babel is an interesting word. In fact, before I go there, um, with, with that as our foundation, there's two kings that stand out in this time frame, post-flood. One king that we all heard of, which is Melchizedek, right? He, he was the king of what city? Salem, right, which is Jerusalem, right? Um, and what is, does anybody know what his name means? King of righteousness, king of uh, the word, um, Jerusalem means what? Right. The, the core idea is one of peace. Um, with the word shalom. Yeah, Joel. Hello? Uh, John, I had a quick question. I stumbled upon this. I, mean, I don't know how familiar you are with the Midrash, but there's a story that talks about Abraham being presented or being thrown in a furnace in Nimrod. You know, we don't have that in the biblical account. Do you lend any credence to that? Or what is your take on that? When I read that, I was blown away. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of stories in, in the ancient uh, Hebrew writings. Um, some of them confirm the biblical story. Some of them add new information. You read the book of Jasher, it does the same thing. It adds new information about the, the biblical stories of ancient times. But should we take them hook, line, and sinker? Absolutely not. Um, if they do not contradict the Bible, 
then they might be true, but I underline might. Um, they're an ancient story that it is found in documents that are not inspired. So with all such documents, you have to take them with a grain of salt. Doesn't mean they're wrong, it just means that, huh, interesting. That's about as far as you can go. So, um, Melchizedek, you recall Yeshua is, it's interesting, Melchizedek occurs, his name comes up in the New Testament. It says that Yeshua will walk in the office of the priest Melchizedek, which is kind of interesting. Um, this um, Amraphel guy, um, another rabbinic uh, story, uh, which I think is, is uh, more substantially grounded. He actually, the rabbis say that he actually is Nimrod. Now, it, Nimrod was a very peculiar fellow. Remember, we read about a month ago about Nimrod. What did he, he was a mighty hunter in the face of God. When I was a young kid, I used to think, oh, he, he's a good guy. But no, when you look at the Hebrew, he, he's in the face of God. He's basically rebelling against God. And he's going to do his own thing. And sure enough, that's what he did. And this Amraphel um, is probably Nimrod. Now, what did Nimrod or slash Amraphel, what, what did they bring upon uh, their city, ba Babylon. By the way, when you see the word Babel and you see the word Babylon, it's the same Hebrew word. Okay, so it's, it's Bet, Bet Lamed. Okay, so the translators just take liberty to add Babylon, but when you see Babel, it's the same Bet, Bet Lamed in the text. Um, what did Babylon look like over the ages? Well, they built a tower, so they, but what did they stand for? What did Nimrod accomplish? If you look through the ages about, about in the Bible, um, you will discover that the Bible talks about Babylon as an invader. They're a conquering nation with their capital, Babylon. And they're not nice people, are they? They're, 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 um, going into a, other nations and they're killing people and then they're exiling these people bringing them back and turning them into slaves so they're servants and what about their their own spirituality what did they believe in did they believe in god no it was idolatry in fact it was the worst kind when you read about what they uh practiced um children here they they um practiced this uh terrible um uh, habit in this religious practice where they would take their babies and they would put them in the arms of this this uh, metal statue that was sitting down in its arms like this well before they would put their baby in the arms of this Baal figure, they would heat this metal thing up so it was glowing red. So they were, the way this thing was made, the baby would be put into the arms and you know, of this molten idol and it would slide down into a hole. And they would drum real loud while this process was going on so the parents wouldn't hear the screams of their children. This is one of the reasons why God judged the Canaanites. These people were practicing very vile things. Of course, none of that is occurring today. It's taken a different form, but the same things are occurring with them. So their paganism was, uh, the root of it was child sacrifice. Um, the Israelites got exiled. They got attacked and conquered by 
Babylon, didn't they? Nebuchadnezzar exiled them for 70 years in Babylon. In contrast, we see Jerusalem. Jerusalem, you find very little efforts. Remember, it's, it's as old as Babylon, and you find very few uh, stories about the king of Jerusalem, whoever it might be, um, trying to expand the borders of the nation. You find no reference anywhere to where uh, a king of Israel went into another land, captured some people, slaughtered them, and then brought the remains back to Jerusalem and turned them into slaves. There's no recounting of anything like that. And if there is, it's extremely minor. I'm thinking of like David. You know, he expanded the borders of Israel. It's recorded in the Bible. But what did he do? He expanded the borders of Israel. He was basically finishing the job that Joshua was told to do. Joshua was told, here's the land that I've given you. And Joshua won back about half of it. So David comes along 400 plus or minus years later, says, I'm going to finish the job. And so he basically went in and um, tried to get the land that God had originally called the promised land and given it to, to the Hebrews and, and tried to finish that. But we don't see, um, now I'm, I'm not saying that um, the people who live in Jerusalem are holy, righteous, and good all the time. I'm just saying that in, in Jerusalem has always been the place that God has chosen to dwell. And I use that language because that's the, the language the Bible uses. It says, I will show you the place that I choose to dwell. He told Joshua that multiple times. And he eventually chose Jerusalem as his place. And, and it goes back even pre-flood. When you take a look at the location of the Garden of Eden and God's presence, it's the, the um, evidence is very strong that Jerusalem was uh, oriented closely with uh, the Garden of Eden. And that was where God was at the time. Anyway, um, so there's this contrasting two cities. One is very powerful and they're, per they're basically promoting perversion. Uh, they, they initiate polytheism throughout the, the world. Uh, as you recall, Baal worship and Astarte worship, which she was the goddess of fertility, uh, and Baal was a male uh, figure that, uh, this goes back to ancient times, um, was a male figure that really represented Satan. So Babel, it's like I said before, it's spelled um, Bet Bet Lamed. Um, the meaning of the word Babel is confusion. And we're going to find that what rules Babylon is Satan, and this is where he's setting up shop throughout all the ages, except right at the end. He's going to shift his focus. And we find that this idea of confusion, when we, when we see ideas, political or moral or philosophical issues that are promoted by people walking in the spirit of Babel, which is really one I want to get to. There's pe people today who are either walking in one of two spirits, the spirit of Jerusalem or the spirit of Babel. And you can identify these people because it's really confusion when you try to um, talk with and have a discourse with people walking in this spirit because they're not interested in what you have to say. In fact, they get angry at you and call, start calling you names. They're, and and it, it hasn't been so. This division uh, decades ago wasn't as pronounced. But as we've gone, at least in my life, as we've proceeded uh, on and on, this difference has been, this, there's a giant chasm now 
between the two, the two cities, if you will. And it's becoming very obvious to differentiate, differentiate uh, from the spirit that people are walking in. And we should be lights on hills to try to drag as many across the chasm, right? That should be our goal. Now the root of Babel is Balal. And it's interesting that it means to anoint with oil or to flow over with water. And it's like, you know, that's, when I read that in the Decenius, I was going, that's kind of interesting. You know, Satan is a master copycat artist, isn't it? Everything he does kind of has a little bit of truth. Remember, like, even the, the Baal, which is a, a, um, a representation of Satan, they found little bulls, little stone idols, which is Baal, okay, the ancient Baal. They discovered these things all over the Mideast. And I'm going, why a bull? Where did that come from? Well, I believe it's one another example of Satan trying to copycat God. Because what is the bull, the meaning of the bull, in Hebrew? Remember, they would make a burnt off offering and... Most times it was a bull, and the way it was killed was exactly how Yeshua was killed on the cross. And, you know, we've learned that the, the Hebrew word for bull is um, par, and the pay, you know, so it's pay resh is how it's spelled. And it's interesting that the pictography, pictography of bull is to speak for man. And what does Yeshua become for us? The high priest. And who speaks for man? The high priest. In ancient times, the high priest, a man, would go in and intercede on God's people's behalf. Now we have a high priest walking in the order of Melchizedek who stands between us and God interceding for us. So Satan's going, I'll just copy the same concept. Because he wants to be seen as God himself. That's what he's going to claim to be in the end. All going to come to a head. That's his end game. So he's picking these copycat uh, symbols so it's going to be, if you don't know, it's going to be really easy to sell the deception. Because he's going to look like the right guy. He's going to look like the Messiah. So this Baal word, the root of Babel, means um, to anoint with oil, um, which is what the high priest would get, always get anointed with, right? And to overflow with water. Um, I don't know if this means anything, but I'll throw it out there. It's, it's interesting. The Euphrates flows through Babylon, right? And it's flowing water, and um, that water comes from the earth, doesn't it? And Jerusalem, um, it comes from two words. Uh, the first one is yara, which means flowing water. I'm going, when I saw this, I'm going, what's going on here? Both of these words from both kingdoms mean flowing water. But where, there's no rivers near Jerusalem. I mean, there's a few little streams that dry, are dry most of the year, but there's no, so... Why is Jerusalem starting off with its idea of flowing rock water? What's the water in in our belief, strict understanding? He's the living water, right? And so it's the presence of God. So since Jerusalem stands for the spiritual side, its water flows from the capital S spirit 
where Satan, he's coming from the ground. He's coming from earth. Remember? Remember we, our study on 666 and 777? He's, he is colored based, but it's soil based. And so fallen flesh is always representative of soil, isn't it? Adam, Adam, Adam God named him soil because Adama in Hebrew means earth, soil. So fallen man is coming from soil or the flesh. And that's really a good definition of sin, isn't it? Because when we make decisions coming from our flesh, are they very good many times? No. But when we make spiritual decisions, when we partake in of the flowing water that comes from Yeshua, pretty good decisions, right? And they bring light. So Jerusalem means flowing water, or it's interesting, it means to be shot through with arrows. <laughs> um, or to teach. And Shalom, uh, Shin Lamed Mem, means what? You all know this. Peace, of course, right? But it also, peace is an interesting Hebrew word. We always think it means peace. Like you're sitting out on the lake with your, your feet propped up on an ice chest full of Dr. Pepper or whatever you like to drink, and birds chirping in the background. That's peace. No, that, that, that's not the Hebrew idea of peace. The pictography is is um, to consume the authority that binds you to chaos. So when you want peace, you go to war. You, you attack, you consume the authority that's binding you to chaos. I remember um, years ago, um, you know, we've all had maybe difficulties with finance from time to time. And Sometimes our inclination, when the bills come come in, is to let them stack up because it's just you can't bear the stress of not being able to pay your bills. But does that ignoring the problem does that ever create peace? No, it never works, does it? What's the best remedy to attack it? To attack the authority that got you into debt in the first place? Attack the authority that binds you to chaos. So the best remedy I learned is, okay, I'm going to open up all these bills and I'm going to call all these people and say, hey, I can't pay you your 100 bucks, but I can send you 50. Or if you give me a little more time, I'll pay you off in, in a month and a half instead of right now. And even though mo most, most people will... They, I, I remember doing this, and it was like they thought you were the best guy. I'm going, I can't pay you. Why are you applauding me? And they knew that I respected the bill and my responsibility to pay it. I wasn't just ignoring it. How come John never calls me? He owes me a couple hundred bucks. How come I'm not getting a phone call? So by attacking the problem, when I got done, I felt like I was on top of the world. Because I had addressed all those people as best I could. And you know what has always happened? God restores balance to the universe and your checkbook. By being, by, by pursuing peace, by going to war. So, this idea of Jerusalem, meaning peace, it also means more than just that. It, this idea of peace means to be whole or complete. You know, I felt a whole lot more whole after I got done making all those phone calls than before. I felt irresponsible. I felt like I was... He trained these people. But when I got done, I hadn't sent out any checks, but I had 
pulled, contacted them and told them my heart, and all of a sudden I'm feeling pretty good. And then I have to follow through. I have to figure out how to solve my problem and meet my commitments that I told them over the phone. But boy, I sure certainly felt peace when I did that. They're all words in Hebrew, their their roots are verbs, right? It's the noun that is the derivative in Hebrew. So, you know, like love isn't a warm, fuzzy feeling, is it? Love is an action word. What part of 1 Corinthians is warm, fuzzy? None of it. I mean, you're angry, and you're tense, and you want it to happen right now. And God says, love is kind, love is patient. Oh, I hate those two words. I, I want it to get done right now. This is terrible. I've been insulted. But God's saying, be kind? That's really hard to do when you're mad. Or you felt like you've been wrong. Right? That's what Jerusalem stands for. Jerusalem is all about peace and love where Babylon is just the opposite. We're not going to win any people practicing this lifestyle by being Babylon. It's a kingdom divided. We're going to win those people, and we need to win them through love. We have to love them in the kingdom. You know, there's not enough love in this world. And if you start loving, you'll stand out and people will be drawn to you. How many have done some love and had, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and had people that do something really odd, like be kind to you back and be appreciative? Or you turn the whole tide of what was happening by being kind and gentle and patient? Yeah. God's principles work. That's Jerusalem. Now, there's some interesting prophecies that are in the Bible. Some of you probably have read these. And what I'm going to try to do is knit some of these things, to, things together. But it means I need to go way over here. But I'm going to, I'm going to come back in the last half hour here. So I'd like to turn to Isaiah 13. I'm not going to read Jeremiah 50, but it, Jeremiah 50 and Isaiah 13 are prophecies about the same thing. So I'll focus on 13. Um, verses 19 and 20. This is a um, passage, passage about Babylon. It says, in Babylon, starting in 19, it says, in Babylon, the beauty of kingdoms the glory of the Chaldean pride. Is that what I the, the glory of the Chaldean pride will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It will never be inhabited or lived in from generation to generation. Nor will the Arabs pitch his tent there. Nor will shepherds make their flocks lie down there. But desert creatures will lie down there, and their houses will, will be full of owls. And it goes on from there. There's some prophecies about Babylon that have not been fulfilled. This is one of them. If we take a look at the history of Babylon, which is well recorded in the Bible, as well as extra-biblical archaeological uh, discoveries, we find that, yeah, it hasn't always been the kingdom of the world ruling the world, but it has never completely been wiped off the map. What does this say? This says that it's wiped off the map, right? Jackals are howling there and animals live there. The Arabs don't even pitch their tents there anymore. So this is an unfulfilled um, passage. 
Um, I'm going to say some things that also are in Jeremiah 50. Um, so you might go, wait a minute, I didn't remember seeing that in Isaiah here. But um, it says that it, it'll be destroyed quickly and completely like Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, it'll never be rehabited or rise again, and the building materials will never be reused. Some people think that um, this is figurative. Babylon is actually New York because New York especially with the new statue of Baal there, as I understand, um, that they've just erected when they discovered it over in Syria. They made a, a copy of it and erected the thing in New York, but that's an aside. Certainly New York has some sinful problems, right? Along with the rest of the country, but maybe, maybe not, New York is leading the charge, I don't know. Um, so some people go, New York is Babylon, thus, there, New York's going to be, because of other passages in the Bible, it's going to get nuked, it's going to get destroyed. Um, but there's a problem with that thesis. Um, it says uh, in, in verse 19, And Babylon, the beauty of the kingdom, the glory of the Chaldean pride. Okay, what is Chald who are the Chaldeans? Are they uh, English or, or New Yorkers? It's telling you who's dwelling there in this Babylon. Who are the Chaldeans? What's that word mean? Yeah, that's right. It is um, a specific name for a specific people that lived now and in ancient times. They were called the, the Chaldees. And they lived in the Mesopotamia Valley and specifically in Babylon. So it's saying these are the guys that are going to catch this prophecy, right? So it can't be New York because I doubt if there's very many Chaldeans living in New York, right? People are always wanting to spiritualize passages. So you have to do your homework, dig a little bit into it, and you discover that primarily, yes, yeah, some, some passages need to be taken as a metaphor but it'll make clear to you that it is a metaphor like it'll say and this is like the kingdom of heaven is like something well okay it's giving you a, a signal right there that it should be interpreted spiritually there's no such sign here babylon is going to get destroyed right yeah Now, okay, we'll take these questions quickly. Oh, okay. Um, we're talking about Babylon, Babylon and uh, I just want to preface with, I, I know that the Church of Rome, we all have family, friends, and, and things that belong to congregations like that, but it would appear to me that um, that, that would be the culmination of paganism in what was originally Babylon. I mean, you look at the sun wheel, you look at the obelisks, you look at um, the in, old things. In um, Rome, you're saying? In Rome, in Vatican, the Vatican. Right. Uh, you look at the position of um, uh, wanting to be recognized as the high priest before the God, and the, the royal vicar of Christ, whatnot. I mean, the, the, the terms go on and on. Right. And so I feel as though we keep on looking for this, this, uh, uh, this person to come on the scene, but I think it's always been there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that, that you know, um, well, that's my thought. Where did Rome get all of those symbols of paganism? Babylon. Right? What? Even the Pope's hat, yeah. It got it from the practice, the ancient religious practices from Babylon. Again and again and again, you know, the reason why the church, I don't want to get too far off the trail here, but the church switched the day of worship from Saturday, Shabbat, to Sunday. Why? Because Constantine negotiated with the pagan priests in his effort to Christianize the Roman Empire, and he settled on, okay, he negotiated the deal, and he said, okay, here's what we're, we're going to shift to this Jesus guy, right? We're going to Christianize the Roman, but 
I'll give on the day that we worship. Because the priests, who did they, when did they worship? And why were they worshiping on, on that day? Yeah, they were sun god worshipers. That's why we call Sunday Sun Day. So it was a negotiated settlement, and thus the day of worship got switched. Now, I'm not saying that uh, if you're practicing your worship on Sunday, that you're a sun worshiper. What I am saying is you're following a pagan practice that's been shrouded over so you don't see the truth. Anyway, there's another question over there, I thought. Yeah, yeah I was just sitting here listening, and you said Babylon and the Chaldean. And I just it popped in my mind Abraham was born in Ur in the yeah. Chaldeans. And that, I just realized that today. Yeah. So that's amazing because the scripture that was on my mind as I was driving today is come out of her, my people, come out of her, out yeah. of Revelation, coming out of Babylon. So that's pretty amazing that God called Abraham out of Babylon. Oh, oh absolutely. The, 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 so it it goes all over the place. I'm just touching on a few topics. But now that you brought it up, um, Ur is fascinating because you know how it's spelled? Yeah, well, <laughs> in Hebrew, it's spelled exactly the same way that light is spelled. Now, who's light? John says that, that Yeshua is the source of our light, right? Right? And the sun didn't shine till day four. Who was providing the light? God was. Yeshua was. Right? So it's interesting that one of the capitals of Ur, uh, I'm sorry, of the Chaldeans, is named Light. So what it's really saying when it says, come out of her, my people, this is in um, Rev 17, I believe. 17 or 18, one of the two. Um, he's ba basically saying, come out of the phony, the fake light, and come into the real light. The fake light is very tempting, and it sounds really good, but it won't save you from your sin. But the real light will save you, and it will do a whole lot more than that. It will reinvigorate your light here, and it holds a promise, doesn't it? That you shall live forever and be with and in the light, capital L, right? So, anyway, yeah, that's a real fun story. Abraham was called out of the phony light into the land where light, true light, dwells, right? All kinds of symbolism. So, where do we leave off? So, Babylon, we see um, thriving around 200, 2000 BC. Remember Amraphel, what did he do? He went down and uh, conquered Sodom and Gomorrah and the five cities that lived in the Jordan Valley there. And um, so they were a conquering people. Um, we see Nebuchadnezzar, year, centuries later, doing the same thing. He was conquered a huge area of the globe and put these people under his uh, control, enslaved many people, killed many people. Um, and his sons followed in his footsteps until they were destroyed. Um, a bit later. Um, yeah, you know, parenthetically, I've, I've done some more research on that, and that is a interesting passage because it's a, it's a poor translation, but I need to find a Hebrew scholar to, to answer to come to the right conclusion. The English says that, that Nimrod founded Nineveh, um, but the Hebrew suggests otherwise. Okay. Look it up yourself, you'll, you'll be interested. Look up the word he, it's not he. Um, anyway. So we see um, 
Babylon being inhabited, even when um, Babylon was conquered by the Medo Persians, in, uh, I'm sorry, by the, yeah, the, the Medo Persians by Cyrus in 539 BC, did he destroy the city? No, he lived there. Remember? Remember Daniel, the stories in Daniel? Well, part of those stories are about Daniel's life working with Cyrus, which was the king of the Medo Persian. He didn't destroy the city. And then Alexander the, the Great came several hundred years later. Did he destroy the city when he conquered it? No. He lived there and he died there. It was. And we have recordation of people living in Babylon around the time of the first century AD. And we have people living through, uh, throughout the centuries up till now. People live there now. In fact, before uh, we took Sa uh, Saddam Hussein out of the picture, he was accelerating the process of rebuilding um, uh, Babel, Babylon. So it's never been conquered. In addition, um, the Tower of Babel is very difficult to find because over the course of the years, people have come in, taken all those bricks, remember, that have been, were held together with bitumen. Well, they've taken all those building materials and built homes and other structures out of them. Well, why do I bring that up? Because the text says in Jeremiah 50 that the, the, none of the materials will ever be used again. Well, that obviously has not been fulfilled. So this is a passage that uh, is explained to us that Babel, Babylon, Satan will be destroyed by God completely and forever. And I'm not just talking about the city, I'm talking about the spirit that has gone forth from the city for the last 4,000 years. It will be removed and we need to look at Revelation before we uh, to, to learn about that, yes. I was just watching the show and they have the guy that wrote the Shemitah year on it. I think it, he's a Messianic Jew. Jonathan Kahn, right? And he was discussing how it's interesting that in 2017 was when President Trump declared that the temp, you know, that Jerusalem should be the focal point of Israel, modern day Israel. And he said that's interesting to him because if you go from 1947 when they retook Israel to 2017, it's 70 years. And he says it was actually 70 years from when they were uh, taken out of the land that then they were allowed to go back under King Cyrus because they've been saying Trump's a kind of a like King Cyrus, though he's not a man of God. He seems to be doing the will of God anyway and what he's doing. Any, any comment on those connections from what you've been studying? It's been interesting, you know, the, the fact that Trump is named Trump. Um, and I've heard a lot of things along these lines. Um, I, I think that we need to be um, lights on a hill. No other country on the globe is so dishonored where everybody's um, um, ambassadors go to their, what's the name of the word? Help. Embassy, thank you. Tough word. Um, to have everybody's dishonoring a nation by building their embassy not in their capital. I think Trump did a very difficult thing, but a good thing. And it honored um, God as well as the nation of Israel. You may disagree, but I think that um, it's been an insult to Israel. And I think it's been politically motive motivated. I think most of the presidents previous would have gladly moved the, the, their embassy to Jerusalem, except there's a lot of political pressure to not do so. Uh, it took a lot of guts to do it. Other, yeah. There's a building in Europe, and if I'm not mistaken, it's European Union building in Strasbourg, but they took uh, an ancient 
um, painting of the Tower of Babel and they designed their building to be like the modern day Tower of Babel. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. But, uh, you know, we talked about um, how European Economic Union is very uh, pagan. In fact, it's a very specific pagan based uh, foundation. Um, it's Babylonian pagan base. I'm trying to recall off the top of my head. Um, what's the name of their? Uh, there's a figurine. Europa. Thank you. Um, Europa is uh, printed or, or uh, impressed on some of their coins, and Europa is appears naked, riding on a bull. Why would the European Economic Union make that as their symbol? I mean, how odd is that? Well, is it accidental that the Canaanites were, were um, they had a god called Europa. It was, it was basically their version of Astarte. Astarte is what? It was the female goddess of battle who was represented the, the goddess of war and fertility. How that migrates into the European Economic Union by accident, I don't know. It sounds like an agenda to me. Why not come up with something new and fresh, you know? Why pick something ancient? You couldn't have done that accidentally. There's little figurines they found from ancient times all over the Mideast with a bull and a naked woman sitting on it. And it comes right out of the book of Revelation. God talked about it and gave um, some prophecies about that figurine. 2,000 years later, in 180, about how these two entities, these two gods, a goddess and a god, Baal and Astarte, are going to come back. They're going to reunite, and it tells what they do. I don't think this is accidental. This sounds like some puppet master behind this curtain. There's all kinds of more more uh, passages out. Maybe, maybe if I have time and the inclination, uh, I'll finish this. Um, the next time I'm up here, I'm up here. I'm not sure if it'll be next week or not. Um, well, what I, how I wanted to end this was to ask the question that I've kind of already hinted at a few times during the course of this, is what spirit are you operating in? Are you operating in 666 or are you operating in 777? Remember the ideas of six is, you know, man's made of three parts, right? Mind, body, and spirit. Each part is represented by a six or a seven. You know, the symbol on the beast is 666, right? We all know that, right? What does that represent? What is that? It's the fallen state. What Satan is going to do is he's going to crystallize and make as God the fallen state of man and immortalize it by imprinting in some form that number on our hands or on our forehead. He wants to glorify the fallen state. See, from his perspective, it's not a fallen state. It's only a fallen state from God's perspective. We're the ones that ate from the tree. We bought into Satan's lie. And Satan's going, ah, you're not fallen. You're just different now. You're mine. I have control if you listen to me and obey me. So the question is, are you three sixes or are you three sevens? Now, some people would go, I'm three sevens because I believe. I have faith. And would, does that make you three sevens? I think it makes you seven six six. <laughs> I'm not going to get at length into this, but salvation is what we procure by faith, right? We believe in the shed blood of Yeshua on the cross, and we are partakers of the good news, which 
we have life ever after with Him, and we're going to give, be given bodies that will never die. That's pretty good news. But it doesn't stop there, does it? God goes, okay, you're part of my family now. Now I want you to look like this. Not look like Ur, the phony light. I want you to look like the real light. So what I want us to do is look inside, not at your neighbor or your husband, because yes, they probably need improvements, but they're going to make those improvements. Look at yourself and go, hmm, do I have areas in my life where I'm a six? I look like, like Ur or I look like Babel. Is there confusion in my life in some areas? Are there areas in my life that need to be straightened out? Maybe you're sitting there going, well, you know, I, I really have stopped rebelling against God. Well, congratulations, because that's what John says. It doesn't say do not sin. It says do not rebel, that's what John says. Well, we can, that means we can do it. We can stop rebelling, choosing again and again and again to make those mistakes. Now, I'm not saying we can live a perfect life. We can still fall and have iniquity. But God's saying, I want you to clean up your act. So look at your life and go, hmm, are there areas that I'm persisting in rebelling against God? Maybe it's not even a, you know, there's in, the, in, in Torah, there's negative proclamations and positive proclamations. And as we get more and more mature, we get good at gleaning out the negative proclamations, like don't steal, don't lust, don't do this, don't murder, don't do, don't do all these things. Right? We get pretty good at doing that, because God's convicting us, don't do that, that pornography you're looking at, that's got to go. And so as we mature, we get better at getting that out of our life. But maybe we're failing sometimes in the positive proclamations that we find in the Bible. What would those be? Yeah, very good. How might that manifest in other actions as well? Like positive things that you would do. Like I see you guys doing this all the time when you guys help me and what we're doing out at the property. You know, it's like, oh my gosh, I just feel blessed. And other things, people come and serve, it's, they're doing positive things. But positive things would include, um, like, what are some ideas? You guys come up with some ideas. What would be positive fulfillments of God's law? Yeah, I like those. Helping others. Yeah. Or when you see people in need, like Tammy needs a ride home after. That's a positive pro proclamation, right? We should all be mobbing her after the service. What are some other things that are positive? Like reading God's Word and not just reading it. Like, you know, some of us have gotten good with speed reading. Okay, I think I can do this in a minute. This whole two paragraphs. But that's not what God is. It's study. Right? How many have learned to study? I'm meeting with somebody this next week because he wanted to learn how to study rather than just read. How many of you are learning how to study the Word? That's a positive proclamation. Excellent. What are some other things? Helping people in need. Being involved in the food ministry. You know, there's a lot of people that actually need food. You know, Pat and Ed are, should be elevated and applauded because of the work they've done over many, many years. What'd you say? Highly elevated, absolutely. And God will. God will. Yeah, absolutely. What else? What else could we do in a positive sense? Um, absolutely. We all need to carry the banner, right? It's a positive thing, isn't it? 
some of us want to hide our light under a bushel, right? And God's saying, don't, don't do that. Let your light shine. Yeah. You know, I don't say this very often, but I think that not all cases, but people that suffer, and I want to emphasize not all cases, because I'll hear it afterwards if I don't, because I truly believe not all cases, but people that suffer from depression many times are sinning because they're denigrating the very creation of God. God did not make junk. And all of you are not junk because you were all created by God. Now we can turn ourselves into junk by being depressed and convincing ourselves that we are in fact. But in reality, God's going, what are you doing? It's like you have a Mercedes and you keep thinking you got a Pinto. How many of you know what Pintos are? I think they're like cheap. They were a car that never succeeded, okay? They were cheap pieces of metal going down the road sometimes. <laughs> so, what I want, to, want you guys to go home with is, one, you're not trash. You're quality. God said that you were very good. Now that your, your sins are cleaned off your slate, look like it as well. Continue to work against the evil that you do, that we all do, and start doing the positive things. Because the positive things, you know, it's, it's really hard. Like, I'll use this example again. You know, this gay pride thing. It's really hard because you want to strike out against them. But, but the positive thing is hard to do when you want to do a negative thing. The positive thing is love those people. They're just like us. They just haven't figured out the good news yet. Well, who's to sell that? Yeah, you are. All of us are. I know your hand's not raised for that. But. We got a, is the mic? Oh, I right there. If you yes. correct my thinking, but sometimes I think there are those that want to follow us all. And then there are those that follow us all. Most people are somewhere in between. Unfortunately, you're right. Um, well, you're, you're either um, loving one or the other. You can only serve one master. Um, you can convince yourself, oh, I'm on the fence. But if God comes back while you're on the fence, where are you? You're not in no man's land. God's going, huh, I don't know what to do with him. You know, God knows perfectly well what to do with you. You're in the other, the wrong camp. You're in the wrong family. You're living in the wrong city. And you're feeding off the wrong light. Right? So, sitting on the fence is a pacification that's delusional. <laughs> you're a hot or cold. Okay. When Gary and I lived in California, we had a ministry to the gay people. And one of the greatest blessings I ever received, we brought this gentleman home to our, to our house so that he could uh, get cleaned up because he wanted to go to church. We, got, we fed him a good meal, we got him cleaned up, we took him to church, and when we were ready to take him back to his place, he says, ma'am, I met a lot of people, but I've never had anybody who loved me in spite of my lifestyle. And I wept. I'd never been so blessed in my life. The church has gotten real good at judging. Um, and when the Bible makes it clear that the only people that we, need, we should be judging are ourselves, believers. The world, they're not going to be won over by us shaking a finger at them. They're going to be won over by love. We have no business judging them because, like Yeshua said, who should 
you know, if you're perfect yourself, then you can throw the first stone. Right? So we need to be mindful of that in regards to this issue and other issues. The, the, the church throughout history has um, done great damage to uh, God's reputation. And uh, it's a sad thing, and we need to turn the tide by loving everyone. It doesn't mean you have to associate with them, but it does mean you have to be kind and gentle and patient and not judge them. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we come before you. We just thank you for this day. We thank you that you would love us enough, in spite of ourselves, um, to give us responsibility and authority to be your reps here on earth. Father, I pray as we go home that we uh, take a look at our lives and see if we're operating sometimes with the ideals and the spirit of um, Babel rather than your ideals and your life. Father, I pray that you instruct us to um, nudge us in the right direction, which is towards your light rather than the false light that, that um, the Chaldean Ur offered, Father. We love you and adore you. Um,